Well, I'm not the one bringing you the word today. It's actually a new friend of mine. His name's Kurt, and um, he came and spoke at our men's meeting just a couple weeks ago, and it was just amazing how the anointing and the Spirit of God filled the room the entire time. I was like, man, this guy is anointed to teach and preach, and then I heard the Lord say, he needs to talk to the church. And so I texted him that afternoon, and it was actually a funny text because I asked him, I said, hey, Kurt, are you okay if I preach on Sunday? Thank you for autocorrect, right? He's like, well, yeah, that's okay with me. (laughs) So yeah, that was pretty good. But Kurt, come on up, man. I'm looking forward to the word you have today. Let's welcome Kurt. You're a blessing, my brother. It's all yours. You will tell me uh, how far to hold this mic up or down. Close? Close? All right. I um, find it a privilege to be able to address the congregation this morning. Um, I haven't done this in a while, so I'm a little bit rusty. Um, I, I, I've been coming here since April, I think. Is that right, Donna? And... Um, we looked around a little bit, and I honestly, my, my heart just kind of, you know how it goes. I'm really not kind of a person who just wants to go along to get along. I'm not really sure that I fit in a lot of modes. I don't know what people try to, sometimes they try to tell me who I am, and I'm not really sure that that's effective. I've never really said, hey, yeah, that's great, except when it comes to the church. And the exciting thing is that when God begins to do something in you, it's usually not just for you. And so when we came here, I thought, you know, this is a church. I sense the Spirit of God. And as I began to pray and evaluate, I thought, there's so many things that God wants to do here. And I started uh, trying to drop little things with Cade. Um, Some of it he picked up on. (laughs) And some of it's probably for a later time. I want to pick a text this morning that goes pretty close to the things that we sang today and also some things that Chris spoke about and just the general heart of D- Dylan, the, the song that you chose, which is the worship theme in Revelation, is such a tremendous element. There, there is something majestic about worship that is beyond the human experience. I say it that way because if you could imagine all that's going on in the, in the kingdom of glory, so to speak, and around the throne are these angels and, and, and elders and, and people. They, if you just read the words of it, it seems like, man, I don't know if I could do that for eternity. But the problem is when you start to get into what the element of worship is, something within your chest starts to beat for the majesty of God. There is nothing like the majesty of God. And I pray that God would this morning use a measure, a prophetic thought to you to help you to focus on things that will make you so compelled to God and to his purposes and to the church that you are are never uh, pulled aside with desires for anything else. The text I want to go to is Matthew 5 and verse 8. It simply says this, as Jesus was speaking, he said, The pure in heart will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus is talking to a bunch of Jewish people, and they're pretty well set in their mind that if they see God, they're going to die. Is that, is that not, not the idea? I mean, you remember when the, the angel appeared to uh, Samson's mother and father before he was born, and she said, oh, my God, I've seen God. And go, no, we're going to die. And then we see this kind of throughout Scripture. But So the thought here is that Jesus obviously is not talking about seeing something physical. The, the Achilles heel to the church today is that we see and we think it's physical. We see, we read the Scripture, and we translate it to the physical. We relate it to the world we live in, to the actions and deeds around us. We fail to do what Jesus is in a measure hinting at here, that there is a spiritual element here 
that you need. The, the pure in heart will see God. And what does that really mean? What does it mean that the pure in heart will see God? What, 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 what's God like? What, what's his focus? What's his purpose? What's he doing? The pure in heart see God. They, they see that God is really what is magnificent. And the reason why people fall into glitches and, and, and holes and so forth, and they lose their focus of their Christianity is because they don't see God. And can I tell you that you, you don't perceive God because it's not the Greek word blepo. It's not see with these. It's the word that has to do with perception. He that's pure in heart, he sees, he has a perception of God. And, and what keeps us out of that is, is our interaction with the word of God and the spirit of God. Can I, can I say that again? Our perception of God is directly related to our understanding of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And when you encounter the Word of God and the Spirit of God, there should be something that happens within you. It's like a divine deposit that happens. And you're three days out and this Word comes back as you're speaking to somebody or you're praying. You, you want to know why your, if I can say it this way, you want to know why your prayer life is weak? You got no fuel. When I was younger, I used to go out and street preach. I was standing on the corner of of, uh, Chicago during their Chicago Fest, and a friend of mine, we were tag team preaching because you only have so much voice. And uh, he's preaching along, and all of a sudden he goes, and I just run out of gas. (laughs) People are walking by looking at him. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, he ran out of gas. Where's the word? Where's the spirit? You, You want to be around people that are filled with the spirit of God. You want, because it rubs off on you, it creates a hunger in you. It creates a desire. You start to, you hear things and you start to see what God is doing in that word. This happens over and over and over in the scripture. There's a word of purity. I wrote this down uh, and I mentioned it briefly at the men's meeting uh, a week or so ago. When I first came here, it wasn't long till I was here that I really felt that God was saying, there's a word of purity coming to this house. And all of a sudden people say, well, what does that mean? I got to throw all my sins away. Well, well hold on. I, I'm not here to try to take anything away from you. I, I'm here to add something to you. I want you to hear that. If you have a small child and you're trying to get him to learn to do his chores, what does mama do? Does she just demand out of him? Or does she say, if you pick up your clothes, I'll give you a cookie? Is that, is that right? That's okay. I mean, I mean, God does that to us. He dangles the carrot to draw us. And, and so uh, the, the idea of becoming pure in life is not about, uh, i got to give up all this. Uh, you got to quit smoking and drinking and chewing and run with girls that do. and you, you, All these things that you... That's not what we're after. That's between you and God. God will work those things out of you. The point is that when we have a hunger and a passion for God, inside of us, he starts to do something that starts to displace what is unnecessary. So I'm not here to tell you how to live a holy life. I I think generally every Christian knows that. We've at least got a grasp of something, but some things we've become anesthetized to, we don't really see it that way anymore, so we just continue on until one day this light comes on and we go, oh my God, I I heard this guy say something and I'm examining my life. Or maybe we're we're convicted because something keeps coming back up again that we've never surrendered to God, and we recognize that being in the presence of the Spirit of God, there's an action that starts to happen in us. Can you hear me on this? Chris uh, jumped onto one of my texts this morning out of Luke chapter 5, tells a story about Jesus. He's out beside the lake and he's preaching and obviously the crowd comes, so he needs a kind of a megaphone type, so he uses a boat to get out. Water, the water casts his voice a little bit better, and then he goes, Peter, he said, uh, drop your net on the other side. Well, we've been fishing all night. We're really pretty tired. He goes, okay, I'll do it. And he does this, and immediately, what does Peter say? Chris, what did he say? He said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Do you know Jesus didn't say anything to him about sin or purity? Do you see what happens when you get in the presence of the Spirit of God? You encounter something of the Spirit of God. There's a, a, a reaction inside of you that begins to purge and to cleanse. Say, so, well, I, I don't know. You know, I kind of like to do this, but I don't know if it's right or wrong. Well, I, I'm not going to tell you whether it's right or wrong. I, you're not here to duplicate my values. You're here to duplicate what the Spirit of God is saying in you. This is what the pursuit of purity is about. It's not cookie-cutter Christianity. 
It's the encounter with the Spirit of God that forms in us who we are and where we're going. <clears throat> Becoming pure becomes personal. It's not duplicated by others. And the reason we copycat is because we fail to encounter the Spirit and the Word. So it's a personal issue of seeing God. The pure in heart will see God. This is a personal thing. But it gets a little bit bigger than this because it goes beyond. You're not here just for yourself. Is, it, is that okay if I say it that way? You're not really here just representing yourself before God. There's an element of the church. There's a, there's a prophet in the Old Testament. He's probably the most prolific speaker of Christ and the kingdom of God than all of the prophets of the Old Testament. Chapter 6 of Isaiah In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and and, and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Let me ask you, stop right here. Um, Isaiah is kind of an upper crust prophet, if I could say it that way. He he pals around with the, with the, the wealthy and the elite and the people that are in power. And, and Isaiah's had a pretty cushy life. He's the, he's the son of some people that are high, and he's got, he's got the spirit of God in him, working in him, and, and, and he's friends with this guy, Uzziah. I don't know how close they were, Scripture doesn't say, but Isaiah spans the time of many of the kings. And, and Uzziah's that guy, he, he began serving God as the king at a young age, and his life was shaped by the priests and people around him. And, and of course, Isaiah is in his life as he's getting a little older, and... and Uzziah decides one day that it's, it's okay for him to go into the temple and burn incense to God. After he's done all these accomplishments, he built things, he, he pre- prevailed in wars, did all these kind of things, and he's got a little bit puffed up, and he goes into the temple to, 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 to burn some incense before God, and, the, and the, a slew of priests come in behind him begging, oh, don't do this, don't do this, this is not your place, it's not, your, it's not for you. God has sent them, and Uzziah got angry at them. And as he was being angry with him, across his forehead began to develop leprosy. God struck him with leprosy. Mercifully, because leprosy is a long sentence of death. It's not like, boom, you don't have a chance to make your heart right. He's got this long sentence of death. He's separated from the people. He's off alone. What what do you think is going through Isaiah at this time? This is is his, his friend. And so he's he's torn. And so when the scripture says, in the year that Uzziah died, Isaiah saw something else. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. He said he was high and lifted up, and his and his his robe, his train of his robe filled the temple. Uh, catch this: in these days, when a king conquered another kingdom or whatever, they would take a piece of the banner from the from the the, the defeated, and they would sew it to the to the back of their robe as a train. And if you had so many of these, meant that you really you really conquered. You, you, you were a mighty king. Isaiah is seeing this picture, and I, I want to tell you, he's not seeing something that's physical because there's no throne in Solomon's temple. And you say, well, that's the, that's the throne in heaven. Okay, but this is highly symbolic. This is highly symbolic. There's two different words for temple that's used in this text. One's the big house and one's the small house. You're the small house. The church is the big house. Isaiah sees the church, and he's so awestruck with this. He's standing here. His eyes are popping out of his head. He sees the Lord high and lifted up, the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings and two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. That seems like a little extra for me, doesn't it, to you? Six wings, come on. And one of them called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It doesn't say it's going to get full. It doesn't say it's going to get full. One seraphim to the other, he's saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Repeats, repeats. Here we go. Isaiah's watching this, and all of a sudden, this thing, it starts to get real. And he doesn't know exactly what he's seeing, but he knows he's seeing something that he's not seen before. He doesn't have the idea that he's going to die. 
So we, we have this understanding. He's not seeing something in the natural. And, 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 and the, verse 4 says, And the foundation of the thresholds trembled, and the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Isaiah, woe is me. I am ruined. I think that when you get in the presence of God, in the presence of his spirit, you, you get ruined for what you are now. And you may be doing very well, and you, I mean, you, you're just walking along. Things are really great. But the farther you go with God, the more humble uh, that you become because you see something greater than what you have now. So I don't want to take anything away from you. I want to add something to you. I'm, I don't want to tell you what you have to separate from. I want to tell you that there is something that's so alive and vivid. When I, when I worship like this song this morning, it's like tears well up in your heart because you realize the majesty of majesties has opened himself to me and to you. Woe is me. I'm ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips and I'm living a bunch of, among a bunch of people that are unclean. I, I really don't think Isaiah went around you know, telling off-color jokes. Do, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? I, I don't think that's what Isaiah was doing. I don't think Isaiah was using words that he shouldn't use. Why does he say he's a man of unclean lips? What, what's happening in his heart that he's, he's seeing this? He's wanting to move closer to God in this. He goes, man, I, I'm done. <laughs> I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah sees God in the church. He, he sees God in the church. The foundations of the threshold he mentions here. He talks about the foundations. He talks about the glory. Is there anybody in the New Testament that talks like this? Here's a, a, Let me say this. Old Testament prophets prophesied. Many times they did not know the interpretation of what they were saying. Would you agree with that? In the New Testament... The New Testament apostles interpret the Old Testament prophets. Are you with me in this? This is why all of the letters of the New Testament, basically, with few exceptions, are written by apostles. Because there's the, there's the contention for what is truth gleaned from what has been spoken. Same thing's true today. The, the church, go, go to, with me to Ephesians 2. I, I want to make sure that I don't... Um, uh, distort anything in your understanding. Galatians, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2. This is Paul. Let's start with verse 19 of chapter 2. So then you are no longer strangers. He didn't say you weren't strange. He just said you weren't strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into the dwelling of God by the Spirit. Has Paul been reading Isaiah? There's something in this. See, when you start to see that you are the dwelling of God, it, it kind of changes your perspective. You're not, you're not in this for yourself. Can I say this? That technically, God doesn't need you. He wants you. You're not stopping any of his plans if you turn around and run away from him. You may, and you may not fulfill what you're about, but God is not going to give up because his his whole perspective of this, when Isaiah sees the church, he says the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. I, I'm not trying to get out of anything. I'm wanting to be neck deep in whatever God's doing. You hear people say, oh, man, it's so terrible out here. The, the world's just coming to an end. God, please come and save me. I don't see God anywhere trying to rescue a church that's about to be stomped in the mud by the devil. I don't see that anywhere. I see God in his wisdom saying, I've empowered this one and I've empowered that one. I've breathed my spirit in here. That I've set the church in motion. The glory of God is surely being seen through the church. And the church goes, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. How many of you really believe the spirit of God dwells in you? 
How many of you believe that you have a purpose in the, in the purpose of church and the kingdom of God? And, and, and you, you believe this because you've been taught this. But see, the reason why that we need apostles and prophets today is because they set things back where they should be. You know this. I mean, you could... Do I want to do this? No, I don't, but I will. You can talk to your best Baptist friend, and he will tell you that the gift of tongues is no longer relevant. And your, your best Presbyterian friend will tell you that there are no more apostles and prophets. And they have, de- they have a whole long doctrines of these things. They, they write books on it. Surely if they can write that much about it, they must be right. You see, what it takes is a revealing of what has been revealed. I, I hope you, you heard that. Uh, uh, one of the major expressions in the church of apostolic ministry in the New Testament is it recovers lost doctrine. L- let, me, let me run something by you. You've, I know you've read this a hundred times. Paul writes to the Corinthians and he tells them, he begins to defend his apostolic ministry. He begins to defend to the Corinthians what God has sent him to do. And he starts to talk about how that we tear down high and lofty things. Now, now you, 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 you usually use that for prayer, don't you? You, you? Let's go back over there. You usually refer to that scripture about what Christian does when he, when he prays. Let me see if I can find it here. I wasn't planning on going here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, chapter 10, again, if it's first or second. Give me Second Corinthians. I think it is. Somebody that's a Bible scholar, tell me where it is. That's it. There you go. Good man. <clears throat> Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ that I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. He's mocking them. He's mocking them. Because they say that about him when he's not there. They talk about him behind his back. So he's, I am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. I, I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I purpose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. <laughs> Do you see what he's doing? He's setting them up. He's, he's setting them up. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the flesh. Who is Paul talking about here? He's talking about himself. He's not talking about the Corinthians. He's, talking about, he's, he's defending his apostolic ministry. And he says here, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh for the weapons of our warfare. Now, I'm not saying you can't use this when, when you pray and when you, when you speak the word of God. But what he's saying is, this is what apostolic function does. He says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is what must happen, especially in today's world, especially where the church world is at today. We've desperately got to have somebody that says, wait a minute. (laughs) No, this is not what God's saying. This is what God's saying. Prophets, their, their predominant role is that they encourage. They speak encouragement. They speak encouragement. They speak, encour- they speak correction. They set things in order. If they have to, they can tear things down, but they build it back up because they're the encourager in the body. The, the, the apostle comes along and, and he says, uh, that ain't right. Let's take care of this. It, truthfully, uh, every apostle that I've ever had any acquaintance with, they're very, very humble people. They're not the proud guy on television tell you to send them money because they're who they are. Most of them, if you saw them, it'd be like Hiram Fly in the old cartoon Superfly. Remember that? Hiram Fly, the little guy in the corner with the glasses and everything. But then when he got in a booth, he became Superfly and took off to care of the problems. This is really what apostolic ministry is somewhat like, is that there's an issue that must be dealt with. And so Paul confronts the Corinthians and he tells them specifically what his ministry is about. And as he continues on, so so we come back to Ephesians, he says the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What apostles and what prophets? Well, the Old Testament prophets, but then the New Testament apostles are interpreting what they said. How in the world? (laughs) Paul goes, do you think God cares for oxen? (laughs) Do you remember that text? He's talking about ministry getting paid. Do you think God cares for oxen? He said, no. He said this for 
Think, would you have ever come with that? What, would you ever watch an ox m- m- uh, doing some corn and go, oh, yeah, God's want to take care of ministers? You don't. It's like that guy in the, in the story of Gideon. These two guys are talking to Midians. They're saying, hey, uh, I saw, had a dream. A barley loaf came down the hill and crushed my tent. And he goes, oh, that's none other than Gideon. <laughs> Where do you get these ideas from? has to be the Spirit of God. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't make sense to our head. But this is what they do. They, they set things back in order. The, it's, this is the church. This is, this is how God reveals what he's doing in the church. Thank God we have people that can help us to see things differently. God is at work in the church. But there's a lot of things that have to be undone. We, we have squirrely doctrine in the church because we, we've denied the authority of people that are gifted of God to speak to these things. I, I, I just, sometimes I'm appalled. Like I look at my office and say, did he really say that? We, we'd be watching something on television or sometimes we'd like go and visit a church years past. I go, did he really say that? What, what is wrong with him? Something needs to be reset. The, the issue is that the church needs to see who they are. The pure in heart will see God. And when your heart is right with God, he can come and he can share his secrets with you. He can share his truths with you. He can stir you to where all you want is more of God. Isn't that really what we say we want? Now, your flesh is not any different than mine. My flesh wants things it shouldn't have. So does yours. I have to keep a check on my thoughts, my actions, my desires, my, everything. I have to keep checking those. My body does not want to serve God. My carnal nature does not want to serve God. I can just tell you that right now. Doesn't want to. But as Apostle Paul, he had the same problem. He said, I beat my body into submission. <laughs> I'm just thinking. Must be where the Catholics got that thing with, you know, uh, lashing themselves, you know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I've never been Catholic. I, I have some admiration for some of it, but some I don't understand. But, but there's a, the, the deal that we have to rule our flesh. We have to take authority over our flesh. We have a temptation. We have to speak the word of God to it. Why? Because we're the church. Because we're supposed to be the expression of who he is. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 3. Excuse me. Let's do 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Yeah, let me get over this. See, I'm out of practice. That's okay. I don't need to do this very often anyway, so. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, here's what he says in verse 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? What does it mean to dwell? What does it mean to dwell? This is where I, this is my house. Paul said in another place, do you realize that you're God's poem? Do, do you realize that you're God's uh, handiwork, one translation says, but it's the Greek word poema, which means you're his poem. You, you have this rhythm about you because of the grace of God. You are the dwelling place of God. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. You are holy. I, I, I've made it a habit for a number of years when I, I greet somebody or write an email, somebody, I address them as a saint. Sometimes I get a little bit of flack back from that, but why do I do that? Because I saw it in the scripture. Do you, if somebody's doing it to me, hey, you're a saint, do you? Oh, I'm not that good. It's, yeah. <laughs> See? See? She knows, she knows that place. But instead of, oh, no, I'm not. No, shut up. This is what the word of God says. You're a saint. You're a holy one. You've been called out. You've been chosen for purposes. He fills you with his goodness and his desire is to make you more like him every day. But you, there's an element about meekness of heart where we, we draw to the place where we see God. Wherever you struggle, that's where you've not seen God. Did, did you just hear me? Wherever you struggle, that is where you have not seen God. He that sins has not seen God, Scripture says. Third John 11, I think it is. So our struggle is that we need to see God. The pure in heart will see God. There's a, a, the next measure that's that the pure in heart, they begin to see the church. Um, l- l- let's go here. Here's, a, here's Hebrews' rendition of, of uh, Moses. If you remember Moses, <clears throat> he's, um, his mother was a banker. <clears throat> she made some profit. She drew a little bit of a profit out of the banks of the Nile, so she must have been in finance. But... Uh, uh, Here's Moses, he's a child, he's preserved. God specifically 
chose him for a purpose. And as he's raised up, he, he gets himself into trouble. He, uh, he, he kills a, an Egyptian or two, and then he's on a run for his life. And he's out in the middle of this Midian desert, and he's thirsty, and he sees a well, and he starts heading that way, and there's seven ladies that come to the well. He goes, well, this is great, you know? And then he sees these herdsmen come up and chase the women away, and they water their own sheep, and then there. So he goes over there, and he knocks a few heads and sets things right and waters the, the sheep for them, and they go their way, and they, they go to their dad. Their, their father is the priest of Midian, now, I find this to be very interesting. Do you realize that Adam had a revelation of God that was of innocence? He walked with God. Adam did not know any evil. He, walked, he knew God through innocence, right? Okay. Abraham knew God as El Shaddai, the provider, the God of covenant, right? There's no conflict between him and Adam. Then there's this other guy called Melchizedek, and he has a revelation of God as the most high God. Abram didn't know God as the most high God until he met Melchizedek. Melchizedek knew God as the God of peace and the God of righteousness. And here's a guy, the priest of Midian. He, he's, he's God's man too. He's got a whole different take on this. He knows order and leadership. He teaches it to, 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 to Moses later on so he can govern the children of Israel. Every man has something they get from God. Where'd they get it? From God. Why didn't God just say, okay, I just need one of y'all. I'm going to choose you. I'll put everything in there. It doesn't work that way. That's not how God is. So here's Moses. He's out here. He helps these women get water. Then he marries the oldest daughter. And then one day he's out in the, in the, the desert and he sees this bush that's on fire. Really kind of an interesting. I'm sure the... The fire represented the Holy Spirit, but this was an actual fire. This was an actual fire, and, and, and Moses goes, huh, I have to find out why this bush is not being consumed. And he starts, starts to draw near, and when he gets close, he hears the voice say, take your sneakers off, this is holy ground. <laughs> and he's going. And then God begins to unfold to him what he's calling him to do. He gets a revelation of God for the multitude. Now, interestingly, when, when uh, uh, Stephen uh, gave his sermon in Acts chapter 7, he refers to the church in the wilderness. This is who he's talking about, the children of Israel. He used the Greek word ekklesia, which we, every, almost every place else translated church. He calls this gathering of the people in the Old Testament the church. It's not like you and I would see it as, but it's the gathering unto God. So, so Moses starts to get a grasp of, of the church. And, and, and if we look here, uh, start down with verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. What he saw. Now you got here's Moses in the wilderness. These guys started out with, what, three million people? Men and then whatever women and children they had. And he hears them whine and complain almost nonstop for the entire time they're out here. He can't do anything right. When he does do something right, they're okay for a day or so, and then they change their mind. They want this, they want that, and Moses is going, what do I do? And if you will, he's enduring what he has to endure because he saw something that God had revealed. He saw Christ. He saw Christ invested in the church, in the body. He sees this. He would never have done it if he hadn't seen anything. What kind of condition did he have to have to be able... I'll tell you what it was. Moses wrote the book of Genesis, did he not? Did you ever read the section there where he says, now Moses was the most meek man on the face of the earth? Is that a little bit funny to you? What if Anthony said, I'm the most meek man in this church? Now, he might be. But when he says that of himself, he goes... <laughs> Moses writes us about himself. Why does he do it? Because he sees it. This is real. God has led him to this point. He endured what he had to because he saw him that was unseen. 
seeing him who is, who is unseen. Moses, remember, as he goes on talking to God back at the, at the bush, God tells him when he says, man, I, I, I can't speak. We, we all have excuses. I, I, I can't. I, I can't. I don't. I don't. And, and God goes, you know what? God got a little up, upset with him. He goes, I'll tell you what. I'll give you Aaron to be your mouthpiece. Now just go. And he goes, well, well then, wait, I got more. Uh, what am I going to tell Pharaoh when, when he asks me who's, who's doing this? He goes, you tell them this. My name is I Am, and it's an everlasting name to everlasting generations. So how broad was this revelation that Moses got from God at this bush, this experience? He realizes that what he is beginning in has great ramifications. It continue on and on and on and on. One man saw something because he was meek of heart, and he goes, I got to see this bush. This is, this is really odd. And in the seeing, he sees God. There, there's another section of Scripture. Let's just go one chapter over chapter 12. Because I, I want to say something to you about, about who we are. Now, it might be that we, we have ideas that someday in the by and by, when I fly away and go wherever to glory, when I die, blah, 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 then I'm going to be all that God wants me to be. I'm going to finally be righteous. I'm going to finally be holy. I'm going to finally be... Watch the verbs in this. This is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to a to darkness and to gloom and whirlwind. He says, you've not come to this. These are physical things that the children of Israel encountered in the desert. They, they, they heard this, the blast of this trumpet on the mountain. They're scared out of their mind. Even Moses is shook. Years ago, I saw this movie. What, what was it called? Uh, Encounters of, the, of a something. And this, this guy that's playing this part, he's building a model. He's never seen it. He's, he's building a model of a mountain. And he goes out there, uh, and, and, and the U.S. government is trying to communicate with an alien starship. And, and they're playing this music, trying to find a way, to, a language to communicate to them. And all of a sudden, the starship hits its horns. <laughs> and it's like the whole thing just, everything shatters. The glass is gone, but people are holding their ears. Can you imagine, here's, here, here is this element that, 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 that uh, is being described to us about the church in the wilderness. That they heard this sound as if it was a great trumpet, and they're just terrified. You honestly think that when you stand before God, you're going to give him excuses as to why you didn't such and such. No, I don't think so. You'll be ready. Not, you'll be you'll, you'll be lucky not to wet your pants, if I could say it that way. Because there's something about the presence of God that's so. What, what do we do? You surrender. This is what you do. You accept what He's saying. He's God. I'm I'm just a man. But He says in this text, you've not come to these physical signs, or to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which. Sounds were such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them, for they could not even bear the command, quote, if a beast touches the mountain, it should be stoned. You hope your dog or your donkey doesn't go over there. They couldn't handle this. And Moses said, I, quote, am full of fear and trembling. But, verse 22, the writer of Hebrews says, but you have come to Mount Zion. Is that past tense? Present tense or future tense? It's not future. I know that. This is, this is who you are. You have come to the Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Abraham, it says, was looking for a city without foundations. Without, yeah, he was looking for a city, but it wasn't, it wasn't a physical foundation he was looking for. He was looking for something. Why? He had an encounter with God because of his meekness of his heart, he sought God. He begins to see things. He doesn't know all the answers that you and I have, but he saw something. So he starts looking for a city. So scripture says if, if, if it was a physical city, he could have just turn around and gone back to Ur. It's not what it was about. He endured living in tents with his son and his grandsons because he was looking for the promise that God had given him, and it was the city, and you are here in this text called the city of the living God. <laughs> do, you, do you see the dynamic of what the church really is? The, ch- the world is in desperate need of the church. There's a voice of the church that needs to rise up and speak to our day. Throughout history, that's exactly what happened. God used individuals and groups to speak to a culture that changed them. 
Martin Luther ruffled the Catholic Church. Just 100 years before him, the guy, John Huss, saying the same thing he did, they'd beheaded him. It was Luther. He didn't care. He's, he's seen something. He says, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh-oh, that messed me up. You are the heavenly Jerusalem. You are what Isaiah saw. You, you are that place that Isaiah saw. When you, when you begin to hunger for this, something transpires in you. You are the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and you've come to the myriads of angels and the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enthroned in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Hello. Remember when I was a young man, I actually heard Kenneth Hagin preach that text. And I go, What? What? Yes, you, that, that's you, the, the, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Do, do, look at your neighbor or your wife. Hey, did you know that you're the righteous made perfect, spirits made perfect? You, 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 your inner man doesn't want to violate God. It's that crusty guy between your ears, the carnal mind. He says, And the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enthroned, enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkling of blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. And he continues on through this. If we kept reading there, he would say this. Therefore, since we receive, verse 28, a kingdom which cannot be shaken, cannot be shaken, cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service, with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And he brought you right back to Moses, and here's the bush. This is our God. I I, I tell you, if I could, I, I would beg you, please look for the church in every page. Find the church in your prayer life. Find a measure where you tie into what the Spirit of God is saying and begin to pray that. I, I, it's okay, you can pray for Aunt Martha's bunion and your neighbor's dog that ran away and things of that nature. I, I understand that, but there comes a place where we set aside all pretense and we begin to say, God, what is it that you're saying to the church to do? What is it that you're speaking to the church to do? The heart of that is already in your pastor. It, 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 Chris talks about this, about the teams and so forth. He, he, Cade stands up here every week and he's telling you something that the Spirit of God has deposited in him. He's urging you to come and join in in this. And we go, that was a good message. We used to say, that's a good speech. But no, that's not what it's designed for. It's designed to activate something in you. It's like this holy awe should come over us until we hunger and pant for what we, what we don't have or what we know that we should have or what we've heard about. Or we look through the page of the Scripture and say, that can't really say that, can that? That, that, that can't really say that, can that? And yet it does. Can you imagine how difficult this was for the Apostle Paul? He's talking to hard-headed Jews all his life. He's one of them to start with, and he's the, he's the better argue of all of them. He can out-debate them all. He's sharp. He's got, and then he meets, he meets Jesus. He sees Jesus, and he immediately surrenders himself, and he begins to preach that Jesus is the Christ, and they, and they want to kill him and run him out of town. And he doesn't know what to do, so they, they send him out in the desert, and for three years he's pouring over the scroll of the prophets and the, and the law, and, he, and, and, and if you will, the Spirit of God is talking him through. This is what was spoken. That's what this means. This, there, Paul did not come up with brand new doctrine, if I could say it that way. Paul did not come up with anything brand new that's never been heard of. He stands before Felix, and he says, I have preached nothing except what was in the law and the prophets. What does the word nothing mean? Nothing. So everything he says, he got it out of the law of the prophets. And he got it out of the law of the prophets because he spent time with the Spirit of God. Then he comes out with this great revelation. He goes, you know what? God's going to make one new man of a Jew and Gentile, form one new. And they go, hey, stone that guy. (laughs) Do you remember Jesus? He's uh, preaching in the temple and he says, Uh, there's a lot of good things that God has done. He's, God sent me to heal the sick and to, to uh, restore uh, 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 legs to the, blind, to the lame and, the, and to restore eyes to the blind and so forth. He says, I, and he's reading out of Isaiah, by the way. And he goes, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. They go, oh, such wonderful words. 
So this is such a pleasant thing to hear. And then he goes, I'll tell you something else. He said, in the days of the widow of Zarephath, there was a lot of widows. But yet the prophet was only sent to the widow of Zarephath. Did you just catch what he did? He just shot the foundation out from under the Jew that they were special. You are no different. God favored the Gentiles. Then he says, there was a lot of lepers in Naaman's day. And uh, yet the prophet was not sent to any of those in Israel. But he went, do, do you see what he just did? What happened? The, the crowd rose up. To, they rose up to kill him. They're going to throw him over the cliff. And he just, I don't know how he did that. Do you have any idea how he did that? He just walked among them. I don't think he cloaked himself. It's like, whoop, cloaking device. Just, no, he just made his way out of there and he went away. And they're, well, that was really weird. But the enemy of the truth of God is man's perception. And to see the kingdom of God, to see the rule of God, to see the power of God, it takes a heart that will spend time to see God. The, 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 the meek, the, the pure, will see God. Um, Psalm 110, let me, let me just say this. The injunction comes, rule in the midst of your enemies. This is prophetic of Christ, Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2 and 3. It, it's prophetic of Christ, um, but it's also directed to, to the church because Christ is the head of the church. We are one body. And, and I know that Christian would like for everything to be easy. We, we don't like struggle. We, we don't like to have to labor through things. But the reality of it is, is that because God has purchased through the blood of Jesus a, 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 a victory, a kingdom that cannot be shaken, the writer of Hebrews says, and you're part of this, he, he is saying to you, yeah, go prove out what I've done. The promise that he gives you, you, you work that until you know it and then you live it. The world doesn't need you to tell them where they're wrong. They already know that. Just like that three-year-old knows he needs to pick up his clothes, but then when he has an offer of a cookie, he's willing. We, we know these things, but the, the, the world doesn't need you to say, hey, you're dying to go to hell. It's true. I, look, I, I used to do that stuff. When I was younger, I was the street preacher. I hit Mardi Gras five years in a row just so I could preach to people, and you know, you can say whatever you want because they're going to say it right back. And, but, but you know what? Very seldom did I have somebody come to Christ. They, they had to really be, they had to be like a, a, ready to fall off the vine. I had a guy one time, he was a blatant homosexual. He was terribly upset with his life. He was struggling with all kinds of things, and he fell down on his knees right there on this busy sidewalk in Mardi Gras uh, and, and, and repented and gave his life to Jesus. That doesn't happen very often. But a life that's lived well in front of somebody, a life that's lived with purpose in front of somebody, says something to them they can't get away with. I, I was 27 or 8, and I, my dad called me one day, and he goes, Hey, uh, uh, you remember your friend from high school, uh, Ty? I said, Yeah. He goes, He called me the other day. wanted to know where you were. He wanted to tell you that because of your example, he had given his life to Christ. And I go, my example? <laughs> Are you sure you got this story right? Became the organist in a church. He, he loved Jesus. I thought, man, man. <laughs> it, it, the world needs to see Jesus. That, this is all it is. If we don't spend, spend time with Jesus in his word and, and be enveloped with his spirit, if we don't involve ourselves in what he has planted the church, how in the world can we be the kingdom that says something to the world? The dominion of the kingdom doesn't know an end. I don't know that God has ever had a defeat. Did you hear me? Say, so, well, what about, and what about, yeah. No, maybe those weren't God's defeats. Maybe that was your defeat. Maybe that was Israel's defeat. But God's never lost a battle. God doesn't, you know, get knocked down and say, oh, what are we going to do? Okay, send the angel Marines. We've got to straighten this thing out. He doesn't do that. He is the victory. The kingdom of God knows no end. It knows no defeat, and you're a part of this. It's an unshakable kingdom, the scripture right here says. It cannot be shaken. Are you with me in this? There's a need for the church. Hear me on this. There's a need for the church to think long-term victory with God. Whatever God does with that, it's his business. But there's a need for the church 
to be long-term in thought. Do you realize that it took over 300 years to build the cathedral of Notre Dame? Did, did you realize that? Some of the English cathedrals took hundreds of years to do this. What were people thinking? An like architect who draws this thing out, he realizes he is never going to see the innocent because we don't have the technology to do what's on this paper. But it didn't stop him. What if the church thought this way? Wow. And then if Jesus wants to take you tomorrow, that's fine. But you're thinking in a direction that you should. So God can do what he wants. But if the church doesn't see themselves victorious, doesn't see that we have a purpose in it, we just sit there and who knows what happens. And God, rescue me. Rule in the midst of your enemies. There's a dominion in the kingdom. What is kingdom? It's the reign of the king. Is that right? You would say that in the Latin, that's the reign of the king. Well, where's the king live? Well, I, I think he lives between your elbows. I, I think he lives in you. I think he lives in your home. I think he lives in the corporate church as it, as it gathers. I think that God comes and dwells among his people, and he knows no defeat. And the things that you fight against are, are opportunities to prove out the promises of God that he spoke, said, this works. And we go, it doesn't work. And he goes, it does work. You stand there on, your, on, your, on the scripture for divine healing. You say, God, I stand in your word. And he goes, it works. And you go, it doesn't work. And he goes, it does. Until one day your spirit says, it does work. And you get up. Same thing with the church. The church needs to be the influence for a nation that's gone awry. There's a prophetic voice that should be coming from the church to a nation that desperately needs to be reset. There's something that needs to be reset. I don't want my grandkids to grow up in the kind of corruption that we're seeing. How do we stop this? Starts on your knees in prayer. Starts in the book. Starts with the encounter of the Spirit of God. It starts in believing what the church is about. It starts in in the church uh, spreading itself out into the culture and saying, hey, you know what? There really are Christian lawyers. That's hard to believe, isn't it? (laughs) You know, they say... Hundred lawyers in the bottom of the ocean is a what? Good start. <laughs> yeah, uh, there really are uh, uh, Christian lawyers. There, there, there really are Christian this. There really are. Why? Because in every sphere of human life, there needs to be expression of God, and I pray that we are the kind of people that are the expression of God in the moment that it's needed. This nation needs our voice. Lord, I ask you today to uh, somehow in all my ramblings to take a hold of thoughts and pieces and sow them into the heart of this people and to equip people to know you, not just as a savior, not just as a Lord, but as a king, as a conqueror, as a mighty God, as one who knows no defeat, a one who controls the nation, who sets up kings and tears them down, the one who calls it, though it's not, he calls it always is. That's you, God. You speak to those things that are not as though they are. And as the church begins to see these things, we speak the promises of God. We encounter situations with your spirit and we bring the presence of your spirit to them that do not know how to find you. And little by little, cultures change, people change, nations change. Oh God, reset the clock of America. Lord Jesus, impress in us your spirit to reset this nation. In Jesus' name, amen.